So in a real workflow environment, if, if I had to create a model for, a, let's say, 140,000 square foot healthcare facility, what I probably would first do is search the database. Now we're, we're tied into Microsoft Maps, so I see an unfiltered list of all the projects in the database. I also see them represented geographically on the map. As I hover over those projects, I see the name of the project, the location of the project, so on and so forth. Now, I always point out to people, all the data that you see here is totally made up. It's all fictitious data, both the cost data and the names of these projects, so don't be too alarmed if you live in one of these cities and you say, I've never heard of that healthcare uh, facility. These are all made up projects um, for the purpose of, of this demonstration. Now, we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about project attributes. Let, let's put those attributes to use. You see here my unfiltered list of projects. Now I can come in and say, I'm only interested in healthcare projects. I don't care about corporate office or retail. Look what happened to my list. A number of those projects disappeared because they were not healthcare projects. I could tell the system I'm looking for projects that are greater than, you know, 130,000 square feet, so on and so forth. I could continue down my list of attributes and say that I'm looking for projects that are between, you know, a certain number of floors, a number of beds where the exterior skin of the building was a certain material type, I can filter, filter, filter until I find a group of projects that are similar in scope to the, to the opportunity that's currently in front of me. When I'm comfortable that I found a, ideally at least one, but, but in a perfect world, a group of projects that I can model from, for example, I filtered this list down to three healthcare facilities I could then come up here and tell the system that I'm going to create a new model from my search results. So let's create a, a cost model using just those three healthcare projects. When I do that, I'm going to create an environment that actually allows me to kind of slice and dice and really analyze the model. So now I could come in here and say that this is going to be my uh, Seattle healthcare you know, center. I could go in and we said, you know, we don't, we don't know for sure, but we're thinking it's going to be roughly 140,000 square feet. Now the date, the date's very important here because I'm going to normalize those projects to the date of my proposed project. And that, that proposed, I might, the date that I put in here might be the date that I think we would break ground on that project. It might be the midway point of the project. It's whatever I want to normalize those three projects to. I could also come in here and say that the project is located um, uh, in a specific area, right? So uh, I could go in and, and uh, uh, select a, a location, for example. Okay, so I could say it's in Seattle. Now the real power of the system is when I click on the model itself, the spreadsheet, here is where I, kind of all the heavy lifting takes place. So here's my Seattle Health. This is the project that does not exist yet today. It's the opportunity that's currently in front of me. And I'm going to slide this off here for just a minute. To the right of that are the three projects that I selected as the basis for my model. Over here on the left-hand side, you see the work breakdown structure that I'm currently chosen to kind of organize my cost and my model. So right now, I see it broken down by system, like uniform at level one, uniform at level two. If I want to see an even more summarized view, I can just see you know, seven or eight lines of detail here. So I see substructure, shell, interiors. When I look at these unit prices, these would be the average unit prices across my model. When I take my proposed quantities, multiply it by the average unit price, of course, I come up with a budget. When I look over here, you'll notice that most of my unit prices are being driven off of the proposed size of this project. A key piece of model logics is they don't have to be. You'll notice that the shell of the, the structure is actually not driven off the size. It's actually driven off of another value. 
So you notice over here it says square foot of contact area. Every one of your work breakdown structures in model logics, you are allowed to set up the unit of measure which makes the most sense when analyzing that unit price, and, and just like I did for the shell. And so the, obviously the driver or the quantity is a different value than the, the overall size of the project. Now, the real power of model logics, of course, is the ability to kind of analyze this, this model in just about any way I choose. So right now I see it by level one. We were looking at it earlier. I could go to increasing levels of detail. So now I see system, but I see the individual systems within that hierarchy. I, we, you know, Uniformat is an example where there are actually three levels of Uniformat. So now I've gone from a very summarized view to, I, you notice here I see substructure A, I see A10, and then within A10 I even have a couple breakdowns. Now, it could be that you're an organization, you don't use anything like Uniformat, you're, you're more of a, a kind of a CSI driven organization. So I could take CSI, bring that over here, and say, here's my 16 CSI divisions or my 49 CSI divisions, and I could see the multiple levels within those CSI divisions. And I can see that very, very, you notice, this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of speed, how quickly I'm able to analyze this information. Now, you might be looking at this and you say, well, I see I can, I can organize a model by uniformat, by assembly, by, you know, CSI code, by just about anything I choose. How is that possible? Well, with WinEst, if, if somebody was using WinEst as their estimating tool, it's very easy because, of course, we know how every item in an estimate carries those various work breakdown structures. We often get asked, but if I'm bringing it in from another software tool like Excel, what does that Excel file need to look like to be able to support any number of work breakdown structures? I think it's helpful to, you know, your Excel file in no way, shape, or form needs to look like this, but this is a pretty good example of, of how items in an estimate could be assigned to a CSI code, a further breakdown of that code, you know, multiple levels of CSI code. And then you'll notice things like Uniformat, so on and so forth, okay? So it's very easy to organize that data and bring it in however you choose. Now, something that we just added to the system that, that most people thought was kind of unimaginable or something you couldn't even do when you're building a model, and that is to actually even use a blend of CSI and Uniformat together. I'll give you an example of how that could work. So let's say that I, I'm seeing this by CSI code, and I see things like Division 7 thermal and moisture protection, but I also want to see my thermal and moisture protection costs within each system on the project. I could actually take a uniform at level one, drag it over here in front of division and drop it, and now you notice I can see my costs broken out for substructure, for shell, and you'll notice I've got Division 7 cost in, in both areas. So you can even mix and match work breakdown structures to allow you to kind of even more intelligently analyze a model. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I see these unit prices. Do I have an ability to adjust these unit prices, to, which would in turn adjust the cost in the model? And the, the answer to that question is yes. What might drive you to make those adjustments is something where you might look at a cost. Now, I'll give you an example. You might look at this children's hospital here and you see the unit price uh, over here for the interior cost. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minimize my navigation pane so I can see more here. But you see this $143 per square foot. That number might cause me some alarm. I might look at that number and think that seems very high. I could confirm maybe some information about how that number was generated by using another capability in model logics, which is the ability to store any and all related documentation for any one of these projects that's in the back-end database. So if I click on the Fargo Children's Hospital and click on the Attachments tab, you'll notice 
I could have many other supporting documents for that project right at my fingertips so I don't have to go searching around the network. Maybe I want to look at these plans a little closer and um, uh, you know, double click on that and actually pull that plan up. And it could be after reviewing those plans, it could be after reviewing those plans that I do understand better why that interior cost was you know, what it was. So I could come back here and say, I want to knock that number down to $130 per square foot. Modelogix is, is smart enough to know to highlight that in yellow to let me know that I manually overrode what was stored in the database, normalized to you know, Seattle in 2014. I overrode that number and put in a specific number. Now you might be looking at that and say, well, you changed that unit price at a summarized view in the model. You don't have to worry. Model Logics handles all the underlying math. So if I take level two and bring that up here, you'll notice that my manual adjustment also proportionately adjusted the unit prices that contribute to the summarized. So Model Logics will handle all that math. It will do it both from a drill down and what we call a bubble up perspective. So if I take something under services, let's say a detail that like a child WBS record, and I change that to $20, Model Logics is smart enough to know it doesn't need to change any of the other child WBS records. It only needs to change D, the sum, summarized total. So when I move off here, it actually changed level D as well as left my child what I summarized it to. Okay, so you start to get a feel for how I can slice and dice the model. By the way, all of these adjustments that I make in the supporting projects obviously have an impact on the model. I can also directly adjust the model. So if I want to make this directly in the model $48, I can do that as well. So I don't have to adjust projects to get to a number in the model. I can adjust the model itself. Something else that I think is extremely powerful is in an instant, and you can begin to kind of see here how long would it take me to gather this information if I had to do it manually. Like right now, we're looking at the average unit prices in this model. If I click on the statistics drop down, you see total unit cost in a second. I see what was the mean unit price across these projects in the model. What was the median unit price? Minimum, maximum, range, variance. Minimum and maximum is extremely powerful. I can, in a second, see what's the least expensive we've ever performed this work. What's the most expensive we've ever performed it? And what's the gap? Because anywhere where there's very insignificant gap, I'm pretty confident that, that those, those unit prices are going to be pretty solid going forward. And I know that because historically it's been true. Anywhere there's a big gap, I know that's where my risk is. And if somebody said, how do you know that's the, you know, where your risk is? Because historically, that's where the, the variance has been. So I have that information quickly. I could also see it represented graphically. So I could come in here and see my three projects over here on the, the right-hand side. And I can see where the average unit price falls. So I can see where my gaps are in unit price. I could see it represented this way. I could see a variance gap. And I can see where my most significant variances are in, in unit prices represented uh, graphically. OK, so I can slice and dice this data, view it any way that I choose. Um, what you analyze is also user defined. You'll notice right now I'm kind of modeling. I'm looking at quantity total unit cost in total. I'm by no means limited to that. You might also be wondering, what's the number, what's the average number of man hours per, you know, per quantity for each of these levels? One of my metrics that I bring into Model Logics was the number of man hours. So if I take labor hours and I bring that up here, Notice now I can see the average number of man hours for each of these areas. So the what you analyze in the model is also, again, under your control. And if you want to remove it, you just drag and drop it off the column. Now you might be looking at this row here and saying, how would I use the columns bar? This we added, too, based on the request of 
a number of uh, model logics customers, and that was they they wanted something more than just a vertical model. They wanted a cross tab model. And I'll give you an example. They might take Uniformat and bring it up here. And now I see each of my projects, and I see substructure, shell, interiors. However, I could also take my CSI division and put it in the row bar, and now I have a cross-tabbed model where I see the 16 CSI divisions this way, but I still see substructure, shell, interiors going left to right across the top. So again, as you can see, you can kind of analyze this data however you choose, completely you know, up to you. Now, let's, let's uh, talk about another aspect of model logics. So everything that we've looked at right now has been for the purpose of creating that conceptual or feasibility budget. Let's turn the clock forward. Let's assume that this project goes forward. It's going to get funded, and at the end of the day, Obviously, a design firm is going to be engaged. There's going to be detailed scope for this project. And at some point, we're going to create a, a much more detailed estimate than what we see here. Earlier in my PowerPoint presentation, I said you could use model logics to benchmark that detailed estimate and do a sanity check. I'll give you an example of how that would work. So let's say that this Seattle healthcare uh, is my model. But let's say my... Um, uh, I've got a final estimate here, let's say, for my Seattle project. So I've got a final estimate. I want to benchmark it against the model. I can do that very quickly. I could click on the Benchmark tab, and you'll notice I see a box here. This would allow me to point to the project that I want to benchmark against the model. So I'm going to grab this project, drag it over the box, and just release it. And now when I come over here, I can walk down this Benchmark column, and I can analyze my final estimate against the model and look for variances that are beyond a reasonable you know, difference. So I might, I might have a threshold of plus or minus 10%. I, I really don't care. I, you know, th those are just differences in the project. But if I saw a variance of 20% or 30%, that would probably cause me concern. I, I either, this is what Holly mentioned, I, I left something out of my estimate. Maybe I doubled up somewhere in my estimate, and again, you could do your, your sanity check at any level of detail you choose. So I could come in here and say, I want to I wanna break this down even further because I'm concerned and I, I want to look at some of these variances in unit prices. So again, you could do that very, very quickly. You begin to get a feel here, hopefully, as you look at this. A, we focus very, very heavily on ease of use. We wanted to make this tool as easy to use as possible. However, we also wanted to make it very clear that to do what I just did in terms of benchmarking and so on, I've had people tell me it might take three or four days to arrive at, at this variance between not just one project, but a group of related projects. So, so hopefully we accomplish that at the same time. 